The sea needs us, just as we need the sea. Good evening. Close your eyes and breathe deeply. 70% of the oxygen going into your lungs comes from the sea. This oxygen is produced by billions of microscopic algae living on the ocean surface. When astronauts saw the Earth from space for the first time, they were surprised to find it so blue. But this is normal, given that the sea covers 72% of our planet's surface. The sea's resources may seem inexhaustible to us, but they are not. It's being emptied of its fish, being treated like a waste bin. The damage we are inflicting on the sea will be irreversible if we don't act now. This is an emergency. We are reaching the point of no return. During this program, I will take you on a magnificent, but as you'll come to understand, also worrying journey. We are in Corsica, in a Genoese tower. There are 90 towers like this built to protect the island from invasion. Due to its overseas territories, France has the world's second largest maritime force, just behind the United States, which is why we decided to film this program in France. We have started here because I believe Corsica has the most beautiful and well-protected coastline in Europe. But the trip you are about to take will take you around the world, because the problem with the sea is global. Look. In the Galapagos, a portrait of Paul Watson. For 40 years, this Canadian and hero of the protection of marine species has not stopped battling. So if you're going after pirates, it's best to be a pirate. By pillaging the oceans, we are devastating environments we know little about. In the abyssal zone, at more than 5,000 meters below the surface, discover an amazing menagerie. Seven islands off the Brittany coast. We filmed the largest colony of seabirds in France. In this reserve, nearly 18,000 pairs of gannets have made their nest. Norway. A giant crab is devastating everything in its path. This is what happens when man disrespects the delicate balance of nature. In Brittany, on the Armour coast, green algae has invaded the beaches. Who's responsible and how to get rid of them? In New Caledonia, the coral reef is threatened by the construction of a nickel mine. And at the very moment, it's going to be entered on the Worldwide Heritage List. Franchement, c'est quelque chose qui me fait mal au ventre parce qu'on est en train de détruire, ce, on est en train de dénaturer ce pays. In less than 40 years, Venice may disappear underwater. On the other hand, the Mont Saint-Michel may no longer be an island. We'll see what man is doing to protect these two sites, which belong to our worldwide heritage. Back in Corsica, I'm flying over the Porto Gulf. This is the only French coastline registered on the worldwide heritage list. And you can understand why. Look. Here, I'm above the Piana Inlets. These rocks have been sculpted by erosion. They tower 400 meters over the water. These mountains are made of red porphyry, a rock of the most amazing shade and hardness. Here we are on UNESCO's worldwide heritage list, Scandala. Scandala Peninsula is part of Corsica's regional natural park. On land, the landscape is dry and stony. But life is teeming under the sea because the reserve is protected. Unfortunately, this is far from being the case for all oceans, where one out of three fish species is threatened. I'm with Christian Boucher, a sea historian and specialist in maritime environment, a very worried and especially very angry scientist. 
Why are you angry, Christian? Oui, en colère et surtout très inquiet, vous l'avez dit, Yann. Tout simplement parce que la mer, c'est l'ultime poubelle. Chacun le sait bien aujourd'hui. Mais ce qui est un petit peu grave, c'est qu'on s'est un peu habitué avec cette idée-là. Euh, on a le sentiment, bon, que les mers, c'est l'infini. Vous l'avez dit, c'est 72% de la surface du globe. Donc on se dit, tant qu'on n'est pas en mesure de mettre nos déchets sur la Lune, pourquoi pas au fond des mers Mais ce que l'on ignore trop souvent, c'est que les déchets, tout ce que l'on envoie sur les mers, se situe sur les zones côtières, là même où les poissons se reproduisent. C'est dire qu'il y a un impact majeur aujourd'hui la pollution, vraiment, il faut le savoir, les mers aujourd'hui sont en phase de connaître une rupture d'équilibre. Quand on voit ce, ce super spectacle, c'est grandiose, mais quel dommage quand même que de temps en temps, la mer n'ouvre pas son immense manteau pour montrer ce qu'on lui met dedans. Entre 0 et 200 mètres, il y a aujourd'hui, sur les côtes françaises du golfe de Gascogne, plus de 50 millions de déchets individuels non biodégradables à moins de 9 ans, des sacs en plastique, des canettes, etc. C'est dire que Aujourd'hui, on ne peut plus continuer à avoir ce type de comportement. Il faut prendre le pouls, vous savez, de la planète. On pense souvent, lorsqu'on parle aux marées noires, euh, que c'est la mer qui pollue la terre. Mais disons-le clairement, c'est la terre qui pollue la mer. This is particularly so in the Mediterranean, because it's a landlocked sea. There are no strong currents or tides here to dredge the sea of pollution. The Mediterranean welcomes 30% of the world's tourists, which is a lot especially when you know that 80% of the sewage dumped into it is completely untreated. We've just discovered that there is much more life in the sea than we thought. Aujourd'hui, on ne connaît probablement pas plus de 15% de la faune et de la flore souveraine. C'est dire que cette mer, c'est un sixième continent à découvrir. On est allé sept fois, huit fois, je crois, sur la surface de la Lune. On envisage d'aller sur Mars et c'est très bien, mais on n'atteint que trois fois les endroits les plus profonds des mers. Et chaque semaine, 35 espèces nouvelles sont découvertes. Alors, qu'est-ce qu'on peut attendre de la mer Eh bien, tout ce dont on aura besoin demain pour pouvoir, je dirais, survivre, vivre, vivre pleinement. C'est dire qu'il y a une harmonie nouvelle à trouver avec la mer. Il ne faut pas croire que la mer, c'est une promesse pour demain, c'est une promesse pour aujourd'hui. Imaginez qu'on tire de plus en plus de la mer tout ce qu'il faut pour notre santé, en termes de bien-être, sans doute, mais aussi en termes vraiment purement sanitaire. Pensez que l'un des premiers traitements de lutte contre le sida, l'AZT, émane du hareng. Pensez qu'aujourd'hui, tous les procédés anticancéreux, toutes les molécules anticancéreuses qui sont dans la dernière phase du tunnel, c'est-à-dire qui vont être commercialisé demain, émane du milieu marin. Alors imaginez, détruire un univers qu'on ne connaît pas, dont nous aurons de plus en plus besoin, mais c'est une folie. Vous êtes passionné You're very head up about this and rather angry, yet what you say also has a very positive side. There are people who've been angry since the 70s. Anyway, we're now going to talk to Paul Watson, the founder of Greenpeace. He was long considered a hothead, trying to save the whales the world over, inspecting boats. Yet now we're realizing he was ahead of everybody else. He's even been hired by Ecuador to fight against illegal fishing. We're going to meet up with him on his boat in the Galapagos. An ecologist, a fighting man, almost a living legend. Meet Paul Watson. For 40 years, this Canadian with the physique of a boxer has been defending marine animals. Today, he's on assignment on the Galapagos Archipelago, a thousand kilometers off the Ecuadorian coast. It was by studying how each animal species adapted to the particular conditions of each one of the archipelago's 13 islands that Charles Darwin had the idea for his theory of evolution. Whilst they may not gain unanimous acclaim, Paul Watson's pirate tactics have the virtue of being efficient. His greatest battle was the ramming of the pirate whaling boat of the Sierra on the 16th of July 1979, which he sent to the bottom without hesitation. And everybody said it couldn't be stopped. It was, uh, you know, it had been killing whales for 10 years and all of the meetings and conferences were unsuccessful in stopping it. So we went after it, I rammed it twice, disabled it, we sank it, we ended its career. And uh, that was uh, something I think I'm most proud of, is the fact that we ended the career of the most notorious pirate whaler of them all. Co-founder of Greenpeace, Watson left the group to fight against illegal fishing in his own style. 
he chose to use a stronghand method and set up his own organization, the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society, Shepherds of the Sea. People began to call us pirates, and uh, I don't really have a problem with that, because back in the 17th century, when uh, pirates were running out of control in the Caribbean, the British and the Spanish navies couldn't stop them. They were finally stopped by Henry Morgan, a pirate. So if you're going after pirates, it's best to be a pirate. When he can't sink the sea poachers, Paul Watson uses an audacious tactic. He catches the boats broadside on and tears off the drift net. This was filmed by dozens of journalists and without further ado, the boat took flight. We've confiscated thousands of miles of uh, illegal long lines and drift nets. We've cost the, uh, the criminals that we oppose, we've cost them tens of millions of dollars. At other times, Watson changes tactic. He stops the illegal ships from advancing by putting himself deliberately in their way. He often comes up against the official police who criticize him for his provocative methods. But does Watson really have a choice? Without him and others like him, perhaps there would be no more whales. So, who are the hooligans and who are the criminals? I have my permission to come on board. We're not in your one. We oppose criminals. And uh, sometimes uh, we've been accused of breaking the law, but we haven't been charged. The reason? The people we're going after will not press charges because they are breaking the law themselves. So we're more like policemen than anything else. We're opposing illegal activities. Uh, please uh, remove yourself from these waters. You're in a whale sanctuary and you're assisting in illegal activity. For Paul Watson, his total commitment to sea mammals is a duty. More than that, it's a debt of honor. It goes back to 1975 when he intervened between Soviet harpooners and a group of whales in the Pacific. Suddenly, a whale was hit right in the head just in front of him. And I looked up into this eye, an eye the size of my fist, and what I saw there really changed my life forever because I saw understanding. I saw that the whale understood what we were trying to do. And humanity's insane. And from that day on, I've dedicated myself to working for whales, for seals, for the marine wildlife. And I don't do it for people. I do it, I do it for them. Watson is also known to a wide public because of his battle alongside Bridget Bardot for the protection of baby seals. By spraying the baby seals with indelible paint, he rendered hunting useless. If Paul Watson is here in the Galapagos, for once it's in agreement with the local authorities. His assignment is to fight against poaching and illegal fishing. The archipelago shelters 7,000 species of animal, of which 2,500 are endemic, which means they've adapted to the particular conditions of each island. The biodiversity of the Galapagos is exceptional. It needs to be preserved at all costs. The most threatened species these days is the shark. To assess the situation, Paul Watson regularly inspects the deep sea. We was diving here today, it was a good opportunity to check and compare in 2006 what it was in 2001 when we first came here. And uh, there certainly is a, a reduction 
in the number of uh, sharks. Illegal fishermen have been here. They covet the shark for their fins, highly valued in Asian cuisine. These images are heartbreaking. It's criminal to mutilate millions of sharks in such a way and then throw them back into the sea just for soup. Because of such hunting, half the sharks on the planet have disappeared. Since Watson's intervention on the archipelago, the number of large poaching ships has steadily declined. But the other threat to the Galapagos comes from tourism. Hotels are sprouting up all over the islands, and with them restaurants, souvenir shops, and dozens of thousands of visitors per year. Will the animals that have been here for thousands of years survive the invasion? I don't think it's possible to have sustainable development in the Galapagos. Personally, I don't think anybody should be living here. Uh, I think that uh, this should be the one place, if anything, where we can just leave nature alone. That would be my preference. But uh, the problem is, is that the Galapagos is a microcosm of what is happening to the world all over pollution, overpopulation, uh, exploitation. Uh, I think if we can't stop it here, then we're not going to stop it anywhere because this is a unique place. Should the archipelago be transformed into an untouchable showcase? Should tourism be banned when it is also a source of prosperity for the poor population of Ecuador? Should we seek a balance between preserving a site and opening it up to the outside world? Paul Watson's radicalism has the advantage, as always, of making us ask ourselves the right questions whilst waiting to find the right answers. Bonifacio, in the far south of Corsica, opposite Sardinia. Here, the coastline has been safeguarded from development, and moreover, marine life is protected because the Mediterranean Basin is one of the 25 areas in the world with the richest biodiversity, just like the Amazon or Madagascar. Did you know that only 0.5% of the world's sea is protected? Italy and France have joined forces to create the Bonifacio Estuaries International Marine Park, which preserves the marine environment whilst maintaining human activity. Jean-Michel Cuglioli, you're responsible for looking after the La Vezzi Isles and the Bonifacio Estuaries. It's very important I don't forget to say that this is one of Europe's biggest maritime reserves. Vous voyez qu'avec 80 000 hectares, on protège à peu près 13 de tout ce qui est protégé en Méditerranée. C'est protégé dans le sud de la Corse, dans la partie française du parc marin international, puisque la réserve des bouches de Bonifacio constitue la partie française d'un grand projet qui est le projet de parc marin international. Often, these reserves are not accepted by the locals, the fishermen and the people who live around the area. Yet today, they've realized it's rather good. En 1992, on était un petit peu novateur ici, dans ces eaux ici au Lavette, parce que ça a été les, les, les premières fois où on a pu monter en toute confiance sur les bateaux de pêche, faire des études avec les pêcheurs, et les pêcheurs eux-mêmes ont, ont pris conscience, ils ont mis en place des, des, des politiques de réserve. What's the essential thing you've learned about the reserve? Dans la réserve. Alors depuis qu'on protège ici, voilà. euh, ici notamment sur les lavettes, en une dizaine d'années, on reconstitue ce qui pourrait être euh, l'environnement un petit peu originel d'un site. Et ça, en, la mer, c'est quelque chose de fantastique, c'est qu'on peut, sur, notamment sur les zones côtières et globalement en mer, produire des effets énormes en très peu de temps. Ici, vous avez cette impression bah, d'avoir euh, une plongée exceptionnelle. Moi, j'ai fait dernièrement une plongée euh, en étudiant les mérous, mais je me suis arrêté dans ma plongée, j'ai arrêté de travailler pendant 10 minutes, et je me suis dit, mais bah, ici, je suis euh, dans une zone qui ressemble à des zones dans lesquelles j'ai été plongé euh, dans le Pacifique, dans les Caraïbes. On n'a pas besoin d'aller loin. Ici, sous l'eau, on a des, des, des richesses qui sont, qui sont très importantes, des communautés qui sont bien reconstituées. There are so many groupers here, they call it Grouperville. Groupers had been disappearing from the Lavezzi Isles since the 50s. Today, we can see dozens of them. 
I went diving with Jean-Michel to observe them. Groupers share their habitat with many other species. Groupers are impressive predators. We were afraid that by protecting them, other species would diminish. The exact opposite has occurred. We think that the groupers regulate the whole ecosystem. I can even get up close to them. That's because they're protected from hunting. This marine park makes up 1% of the protected area of the Mediterranean, and yet we still find traces of pollution. Look at this. Look, it's dried out. Oh, sorry, no, that's him. Oh, yes, look, it's all over the beach. But this is not from an oil slick. This is from boats emptying their tanks. They clean out their oil tanks with seawater. And we estimate that this pollution is 10 times more significant than from oil slicks, however spectacular they are. Because of the boats cleaning out their tanks in the open sea rather than in the ports, at least 2 million tons of petroleum products are dumped every year into the oceans. This is incredible the equivalent of two oil slicks the size of the Erika tanker every week. The Lavezzi Isles have not been spared maritime disasters. In this cemetery, there lie the 750 victims from when the Semiad ran aground in 1855. What worries the people here is if there should be an accident. However, it's forbidden to transport hazardous materials through this strait. Did you know that worldwide, one big tanker shipwrecks every three days, each time with a major pollution risk? In the abyss, in the deepest depths, the pressure level is one ton per square centimeter. There is no light, and yet, as you will see, life exists even so. This creature is not an extraterrestrial. It's one of the many beings living at more than 5,000 meters below the ocean's surface. The abyssal zone starts where sunlight can no longer reach and takes up more than 80% of the total volume of the oceans. At its deepest, where man is but an intruder, these animals, mostly unknown to science, live in extreme conditions. At the bottom of the ocean, it is cold. The temperature never goes above two degrees. Food is scarce and the pressure is enormous. At 6,000 meters deep, under this mass of water, imagine the weight of a car crushing your finger. So as not to implode, the vast majority of deep sea animals are gelatinous. At 50 meters long, the siphonophore is the largest invertebrate on the planet. It is full of water and empty of all gases so as to keep its shape. This flying octopus is called Dumbo because of its ears. They allow it to swim and propel itself on the currents. It moves slowly. Life is slow in the abyssal zone. Energy is saved. Everything is in slow motion. Until the beginning of the 20th century, scientists believed that life at the bottom of the ocean was impossible. Today, scientific expeditions have manned submarines and highly sophisticated remote control robots at their disposal, so they may penetrate this once inaccessible world. But to this day, man knows space better than the greatest depths. Only 1% of the abyssal zone has been explored. One might as well call it a drop in the ocean. At more than 10 kilometers below the surface, food is more or less non-existent. Those at the bottom of the food chain feed on animal carcasses drawn down by gravity, like this whale, which will be devoured in a few days by these worms, veritable vultures of the deep. These monstrous, gaping mouths conjure up the violent battles of these carnivores who let nothing go. 
some animals have organs that can emit light. Like this angler, one of the most fearsome predators of the Great Depths. He uses the ray of light planted between his eyes as a hunting strategy to catch his prey. Another lighting display, but this time to catch a sexual partner. The deep conceals many more surprises. Nearly 30 years ago, an expedition discovered the most amazing ecosystem at 3,000 meters deep. Whilst at the bottom of the sea the population density is very low, around these underwater volcanoes and hydrothermal springs, life teems and bustles. These furnaces exude toxic heavy metals. The temperature can reach 350 degrees. And yet, around these hot springs, researchers found species which could develop without solar energy, otherwise indispensable to life on Earth. What this oasis has revealed makes us question our beliefs in the origins and development of life. Just as we've detected the presence of water on Mars, more than half of the rest of our planet remains to be discovered. The Abyssal Zone has yet to reveal all its mysteries. On the mainland, more than 11% of land is now protected. But the oceans are not so lucky. Because we can't fly over them like this and see so easily what's going on. Here in Corsica, the habitat of the wild pig is protected but there's much less concern for the underwater species. The highest rocky peaks are not on land, but in the oceans. The highest mountain is not Everest, it's the island of Hawaii, the summit of an underwater mountain over 9,200 meters high. Invisible to our eyes, barely mapped, the bottom of the sea, unlike our continents, remains a mystery. 90% of marine species are still unknown to us. We've just begun studying them, only to realize they are threatened by our exploitation of the sea. Are we wise enough to protect what we cannot see? I will take you to a rock lobster port, where the local fishermen are seriously starting to ask themselves these questions. Here we're in Centuri, but in Corsica they say Centur. We're on the Corsican Cape in the north of the island, and this is one of the oldest fishing ports and moreover the most important in Corsica. We're with Nicola Mailis, a rock lobster fisherman. He told me earlier that in his lifetime he has caught nearly 30,000 rock lobsters, up to 20 kilos a day. Why? How many fishermen fish here? Did you fish with such big nets before? No. So what are you going to do? Eh voilà, on a pris la décision, on s'est réunis tous les pêcheurs et on a décidé de réglementer les filets, de les baisser d'en avoir beaucoup moins de longueur en mer, afin de donner la chance à la langouste de se refaire. Et la meilleure solution, ce serait de ne pas la pêcher pendant un certain nombre d'années. Stop, stop fishing completely? What would you fish in the meantime? Le poisson, il faudrait qu'on ait une compensation pour pouvoir tenir, pour payer nos, nos charges. Mais But si vous n'arrivez pas à avoir de compensation, il va falloir que vous arrêtiez de pêcher. Ce sera impossible. On, peut, on continuera à pêcher ce qu'on pêche. 
So if there's no compensation, you're going to fish until there are no more lobsters left? That's a bit idiotic, isn't it? Thanks very much, Nicolas. In France, we consume 35 kilos of fish per year and per inhabitant. In Japan, it's 75 kilos. We estimate that one out of two people in the world relies on their food coming from the sea. A frightening figure. In 1950, we caught 18 million tons of fish per year. Today, it's nearly 100 million. We are completely emptying the sea. To such an extent that 60% of the fish consumed in Europe no longer comes from our shores. I will take you to West Africa, an area invaded by trawlers from the world over. Industrial fishing is threatening the living conditions of the local fishermen. And as you'll see, everything is not so simple. the Bijagos archipelago just off Guinea-Bissau. A string of a hundred islands edged with mangrove swamps and planted with palm groves. Only 20 are inhabited. In these waters, fish are abundant, but for how long? For this is the threat, Chinese trawlers. These basically equipped coffin ships have already pillaged the waters of Senegal and Guinea-Conakry. Their crews are paid a pittance and work in very tough conditions. And in one day, they swipe what the Bijagas fishermen catch in a month. The fish are then delivered to factory ships and sold on the international markets. an ecological disaster taking place unwitnessed because the Chinese trawlers cruise the open sea. Felipe Cardozo is sending out the alert. In charge of making sure the fish quotas are respected in the region, he regularly inspects the archipelago. L'archipel Bijago est menacé pour la traitement de pêche parce qu'il y a beaucoup de pêcheurs qui viennent de, de, de d'autres pays pour venir pêcher ici. That the fish are disappearing is a particularly sensitive problem in the Bijagas, because for the inhabitants of these isles, the sea is sacred. Binte village on the island of Karach. Disguised as a hammerhead shark, the dance seeks the benevolence of the gods. This is the most revered animal. It symbolizes the power of nature. Lamine is a fisherman. He uses a simple net with lead weights, which he throws a few meters away the opposite of industrial fishing. For the Bijagas don't sell the fish they catch, they take only what they need. For Lamine, it's just what he needs to feed his family and the village elders. But today, even his modest requirements are barely covered. In one morning, Lamine has managed to catch only six small mullets. Who's responsible for this shortage? Lamine has his own idea. But Lamine is mistaken. It's the Chinese trawlers who fish 90% of the region's fish who are really responsible. But as they cruise the open sea, Lamine has never seen them. 
So he accuses the Senegalese and the Sierra Leone fishermen who've settled the island of Porcos quite illegally, in the heart of this region so well stocked with fish. Today, more than 400 people are living here, sustaining a genuine small fishing industry in equally precarious conditions. In order to try and make the Porcos fishermen aware of respect for the environment, Felipe comes here every month and gathers them in assembly. But Felipe has trouble getting his message across to these fishermen who are fighting every day for their survival. Impossible to know exactly how many fish are caught illegally and then exported. No checks exist here. According to Felipe, there's only one, probably unfair way, of fighting against overfishing. But the small-time fishermen of Porcas are only part of the problem. Even if the government evicts them, the real culprits of overfishing are elsewhere. Of the archipelago, groups like Greenpeace denounce the Asian trawlers who are literally stealing the fish. In Guinea-Bissau, the government is becoming aware of the problem. But the fines are so high that the owners don't pay them and just let the boats rot in situ. In one year, 40 of these trawlers were inspected. A complete waste of time. What is there to hope for? Estou convencido que amanhã vai ser o melhor dia, porque tudo ainda está implicado. Medidas de correção têm que ser de urgência, porque se não deixa tempo na passa, cada vez mais mal na bingo. Pensa que as medidas têm que ser rápido. O governo tem que acelerar o processo. A própria população tem que acompanhar o processo e assumir a responsabilidade sobre a gente que está vivendo no arquipélago. As with oil, the sea's resources are limited. And as with oil, there is the threat of a shortage. And yet, fishing relies on a renewable resource. Will man ever be able to imagine sustainable management of fishing, be it in the Bijagas or elsewhere? Today, this question is crucial. For right now, we are exhausting our seas. 75% of fish stocks are threatened with over-exploitation. This is the reality of the ocean today. 90% of large fish such as tuna or cod have been eliminated in one century. Today, the big trawlers are equipped with sonar and helicopters. No shoal of fish can escape them. Yet despite these ever more sophisticated means, the catches haven't increased in tonnage for 20 years. As the fish at the surface are disappearing, the trawlers are equipped to trawl up to 2,000 meters deep, raking the marine ecosystems at the bottom. It's like picking apples with a bulldozer that digs up all the apple trees. The result? In 30 years, some species have disappeared by 99% and no chance they'll come back. Their habitat has been destroyed, as well as their reproductive cycle. There are no longer enough of them. And that's not all. Industrial fishing is not selective. According to some specialists, 25% of the fish caught are thrown back into the sea for nothing. The damage is enormous. 300,000 whales and dolphins as well as seabirds and 40,000 turtles are killed by nets and hooks every year. What should be done? The choices are very complex. Let's not forget that 200 million people in the world live on fishing, and it's one of the most difficult and dangerous jobs in the world. 
24,000 fishermen are lost at sea every year. Should we question our responsibilities as consumers? Yes. Should we reduce the catch size and compensate the fishermen's loss of income? Yes. Stop industrial fishing subsidies? Yes. Help local fishermen? Yes. Turn towards breeding fish? Perhaps. Today, nearly 50% of the fish we consume are bred. They come from fish farms. Amazingly, fish farming has been the fastest developing business activity after the internet. Here we are near the Songina Isles in Ajaccio, on the site of the most important fish farm in France. We are with Mr. Denis Charvoz, one of the biggest sea bass and sea bream breeders in France. C'est un nouveau métier, paysan de la mer. Donc euh, on a des, des, des cages dans lesquelles on, on met des, des bébés poissons et puis on va les garder 2-3 ans euh, avant de les pêcher et puis de les commercialiser pour les différents euh, supermarchés ou restaurants. So careful here because we've gone from harvesting, that's to say fishing, to industrial breeding. So we don't want to make the same errors as we did with pigs, for example. Exactement, les mentalités doivent évoluer parce que aujourd'hui on trouve peut-être plus écolo de de pêcher. Malheureusement, la ressource diminue de manière drastique, et donc des solutions comme comme l'élevage ont commencé à à se développer dans les années 80. En mer, on a la chance d'avoir des eaux d'excellente qualité, particulièrement ici, et en ayant une densité relativement faible dans les cages et une alimentation peu intensive, là on obtient effectivement du poisson d'excellente qualité sans avoir besoin de traiter et en ayant justement un milieu qui reste préservé. Could fish farming be the solution to save wild fish? The problem is that to get one kilo of farmed fish, at least four kilos of wild fish need to be reduced to flour. Do you get enormous amounts of parasite fish coming to feed in and around the farms? It's what we call the poissons commensaux, that is, it's the poissons less noble than the bar or the dorade, which are essentially predators, but who will, justly, and that's what's good, they will ingest the waste of the fish we have in the cages, and that will serve, that will make a kind of concentration of fish, or of artificial fish, to the mules, who will be placed again on the cages, and who will reappear again. This is the most important thing, that's what we call the poissons commensaux, that is, it's the poissons less noble than the bar or the dorade, which are essentially predators, but who will, justly, and that's what's good, they will make a kind of concentration of fish, or of artificial fish, to the mules, who will be placed again on the cages, and who will reappear again. The food you feed the fish on comes from Peru or Chile? That's not very sustainable development. Oui, mais c'est les endroits où aujourd'hui il n'y a pas d'industrie chimique. Mais c'est une farine qui est plus chère aussi. Les granulés qui sont agglomérés avec de la protéine marine, donc ces fameux stocks de poissons qu'on peut trouver au Pérou, et protéines végétales issues de l'agriculture, donc comme le soja, blé, maïs. Soya, which also comes from Brazil. C'est très difficile aujourd'hui de trouver du soja sans OGM. Alors dans cette alimentation-là, c'est du soja français. Ah, merci. Thank you. Vous êtes content de faire ce métier? C'est un beau métier. C'est pas facile tous les jours, mais c'est un beau métier. J'espère que que mes enfants auront un métier aussi proche de la mer, parce que avoir la chance de faire cette activité dans un pays aussi magnifique, c'est quand même mieux qu'au bureau. We need to find a better solution for feeding the fish. This is the main handicap to sustainable development in this industry. A natural marine environment is very fragile, as with all natural environments. A balance has been set up over millions of years. Now you think of this, the giant crab known as the Stalin crab, which lives in Alaska and eastern Russia. You import it to western Russia to farm it intensively. Well, that crab is now disrupting the whole ecology of the Nordic countries' coastlines. This mountain of crabs is invincible. No attacker, cod, hake, haddock, can get the better of them. They behave like no other crabs. The worst ensemble of small crabs I've seen when we were on the dicketour is 
er altså du kan sammenligne med fotballbanelengder. These baby crabs already know how to defend themselves and at adulthood become this giant crab. It's called the Stalin crab. As it has no predators, it proliferates freely and devours everything in its path. At the outermost reaches of Norway is the region of Finnmark, the zone the furthest north of Europe. This is where the frontier between Russia and Finland passes. This tip of the world dominates the Barents Sea. For centuries, fishing has obviously been the main activity for those who cling to this desolate place. But today, the age-old balance is being endangered by the giant crab. Both large and small crabs predate in coastal shallow waters year-round in the Barents Sea. This might give a higher pressure in coastal areas in the Barents Sea. They all need food. And my question is, is there food for everyone? Lise Lindahl Jorgensen, the only Norwegian specialist on the giant crab, is ringing the alarm bell. The animal eats everything it finds, fish, shellfish, starfish. In its original environment in the northern Pacific, the giant crab had natural predators like this enormous catfish, which limited its population increase. In Norway, however, the giant crab has no enemy and can grow in total freedom. Result, the crab population has exploded. In the long run, they could transform the seabed into a desert. The main victims are the fishermen. Han gör så mycket skada. Han gör skada på fiskeskapen. Han gör på garn och på lina och och i tillägg till det så så ödelägger du havbot. Så på på lång sikt så 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 blir det väl katastrof. Hela krabben. A complete catastrophe. Not exactly what the Soviets were hoping when they introduced the crab into the Barents Sea on a massive scale. For them, this was a magical crab from which the population of Vladivostok, 7,800 kilometers away in the far east of the Soviet Union, profited. As of 1961, teams took thousands of crabs from the Pacific and sent them by special train from Vladivostok to Murmansk. The authorities, led by Khrushchev, wanted to give a new resource to the Russian fishers in this impoverished region. In Moscow, the man who was in charge of these crabs remembers the strange method used to select the crabs to be sent west. We переворачивали их на спину, и если они быстро вставали на ноги, то отправляли на запад. А если они вот так болтали ногами, долго не могли встать, то тогда between 1961 and 1969, the most agile crabs made the long train journey to the west. Yuri, who believed himself to be a national hero for his great idea, has a hard time understanding that today the Norwegian seabed is at risk of being totally devastated by this invader. Gold indeed, for the delicate flesh, sells for up to 100 euros a kilo. For this declining region, the crab is a financial godsend. The biggest of the giant crabs weighs up to 12 kilos, with a span of two meters. But the Norwegian fishermen are only allowed to catch 300,000 crabs per year, and not one more, out of 15 million counted crabs. These quotas have been fixed under Russian pressure, who want to maintain the price. These limitations are accelerating the expansion of the species even more. We fish here with a big handcrabben, and then we give out the handcrabben. And that must be wrong for us. It's just a whole lot for us. The fishermen have to throw back all the young and the females, who can lay up to 40,000 eggs a year. 
Result? After having spread into the Barents Sea, today the giant crab is further west in the Norwegian Sea. If nothing stops it, it could spread along the European coastline. Only the warm waters in the Strait of Gibraltar could stop it. Nature is adapted to short-term catastrophic events, like oil spill. But the red king crab has come to stay. How the red king crab affect the coastal near ecosystem of the Barents Sea, we don't know. And that worries me. Here, at what seems like the end of the world, an ecological delayed time bomb seems to have been set in motion by man. This threat approaches our coastline daily. The giant crab can travel up to 15 kilometers a day, and the distance between him and us is diminishing. By ignoring the delicate balance of nature, man has set off a bomb. His turn now to play bomb disposal expert. Ce qui est un petit peu grave, c'est qu'on s'est un peu habitué avec cette idée-là. Euh, on a le sentiment, bon, que les mers, c'est l'infini, vous l'avez dit, c'est 72% de la surface du globe. Donc on se dit, tant qu'on n'est pas en mesure de mettre nos déchets sur la Lune, pourquoi pas au fond des mers Mais ce que l'on ignore trop souvent, c'est que les déchets, tout ce que l'on envoie sur les mers, se situe sur les zones côtières, là même où les poissons se reproduisent. C'est dire qu'il y a un impact majeur aujourd'hui de la pollution. Vraiment, il faut le savoir, les mers aujourd'hui sont en phase de connaître une rupture d'équilibre. Quand on voit ce, ce super spectacle, c'est grandiose. Mais quel dommage quand même que de temps en temps, la mer n'ouvre pas son immense manteau pour montrer ce qu'on lui met dedans. Entre 0 et 200 mètres, il y a aujourd'hui, sur les côtes françaises du golfe de Gascogne, plus de 50 millions de déchets individuels non biodégradables à moins de 9 ans, des sacs en plastique, des canettes, etc. C'est-à-dire que... Aujourd'hui, on ne peut plus continuer à avoir ce type de comportement. Il faut prendre le pouls, vous savez, de la planète. On pense souvent, lorsqu'on parle aux marées noires, euh, que c'est la mer qui pollue la terre. Mais disons-le clairement, c'est la terre qui pollue la mer. This is particularly so in the Mediterranean because it's a landlocked sea. There are no strong currents or tides here to dredge the sea of pollution. The Mediterranean welcomes 30% of the world's tourists, which is a lot especially when you know that 80% of the sewage dumped into it is completely untreated. Has not stopped battling. So if you're going after pirates, it's best to be a pirate. By pillaging the oceans, we are devastating environments we know little about. In the abyssal zone, at more than 5,000 meters below the surface, discover an amazing menagerie. Seven islands off the Brittany coast. We filmed the largest colony of seabirds in France. In this reserve, nearly 18,000 pairs of gannets have made their nest. Norway, a giant crab is devastating everything in its path. This is what happens when man disrespects the delicate balance of nature. In Brittany on the Armour coast, green algae has invaded the beaches. Who's responsible and how to get rid of them? In New Caledonia, the coral reef is threatened by the construction of a nickel mine. And at the very moment, it's going to be entered on the worldwide heritage list. Franchement, c'est quelque chose qui me fait mal au ventre parce qu'on est en train de détruire, ce, on est en train de dénaturer ce pays. In less than 40 years, Venice may disappear underwater. On the other hand, the Mont Saint-Michel may no longer be an island. We'll see what man is doing to protect these two sites, which belong to our worldwide heritage. Back in Corsica, I'm flying over the Porto.
just as we need the sea. Good evening. Close your eyes and breathe deeply. 70% of the oxygen going into your lungs comes from the sea. This oxygen is produced by billions of microscopic algae living on the ocean surface. When astronauts saw the Earth from space gulf, this is the only French coastline registered on the worldwide heritage list. And you can understand why. Look. Here I'm above the Piana inlets. These rocks have been sculpted by erosion. They tower 400 meters over the water. These mountains are made of red porphyry, a rock of the most amazing shade and hardness. Here we are on UNESCO's worldwide heritage list, Scandala. The Scandala Peninsula is part of Corsica's regional natural park. On land, the landscape is dry and stony. But life is teeming under the sea because the reserve is protected. Unfortunately, this is far from being the case for all oceans, where one out of three fish species is threatened. I'm with Christian Boucher, a sea historian and specialist in maritime environment, a very worried and especially very angry scientist. Why are you angry, Christian? Oui, en colère et surtout très inquiet. Vous l'avez dit, tout simplement parce que la mer, c'est l'ultime poubelle. Chacun le sait bien aujourd'hui, mais. For the first time, they were surprised to find it so blue. But this is normal, given that the sea covers 72% of our planet's surface. The sea's resources may seem inexhaustible to us, but they are not. It's being emptied of its fish being treated like a waste bin. The damage we are inflicting on the sea will be irreversible if we don't act now. This is an emergency. We are reaching the point of no return. During this program, I will take you on a magnificent, but as you'll come to understand, also worrying journey. We are in Corsica, in a Genoese tower. There are 90 towers like this built to protect the island from invasion. Due to its overseas territories, France has the world's second largest maritime force, just behind the United States, which is why we decided to film this program in France. We have started here because I believe Corsica has the most beautiful and well-protected coastline in Europe. But the trip you are about to take will take you around the world because the problem with the sea is global. Look. In the Galapagos, a portrait of Paul Watson. For 40 years, this Canadian and hero of the protection of marine species